Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Edward Schultz. I'm the director of the emergency department and hyperbaric unit at King Edward VII Memorial Hospital. This is the hyperbaric chamber that you see behind me, and we use this to treat diving accidents as well as patients with radiation injury and some infections and diabetic foot wounds. But what we're really here to talk about today is drowning, and particularly as it may affect children. What actually happens when someone drowns is they're suffocated by water blocking the upper airway. So what happens is uh, the person gets into trouble, they get water in the upper airway, and the larynx, the vocal cords, go into spasm initially. When that happens, the person actually swallows a lot of seawater. So in the first phase of drowning, people tend to get a stomach full of seawater or pool water, whatever medium they're drowning in. Gradually, they pass out from lack of oxygen because they're not getting any oxygen because their, their airway is blocked by the water. And at that point, in about 85% of the cases, the larynx will actually, the vocal cords will actually open up and water will go down into the lungs. In about 15% of cases, water never gets in the lungs. It's what we call a dry drowning. And obviously, uh, those patients do better if you can rescue them because they don't have any fluid in their lungs, so you can perform CPR much better, you can oxygenate them much better, and they don't get into complications with their lungs um, after, after the drowning event. When you don't have any oxygen, your brain is damaged within four to six minutes. You'll have death of the brain. And the other thing that happens is your heart requires a lot of oxygen, so your heart stops. So initially, you may have a respiratory arrest, and you then go on to have a cardiac arrest. Your heart stops, and, and basically, you're in full cardiopulmonary arrest at the time somebody rescues you if you're rescued. Drowning. By definition, a drowning is death by submersion, which leads to suffocation as we described. A near drowning is survival for at least 24 hours after submersion. So a near drowning is someone who lives at least 24 hours. Now they may go on to die two, three days later or a week later, but to be a near drowning they survive at least 24 hours. You know, I think people think about the ocean and they worry about drowning. They think about pools and they worry about drowning. But you can actually drown in 30 millimeters of water, and that's 30 millimeters of water. So uh, children can drown in a bathtub. They can drown in a kiddie pool. They can drown in a bucket of water. Uh, there are well-described cases where people have actually drowned in a puddle if they've been intoxicated. So it doesn't take much. It, it just basically takes enough water to block the upper airway. Now there are some special circumstances where people have been known to survive after 30 or even 45 minutes in water and, and submersion in water. And those drowning victims drown in very, very cold water. There's a condition called a mammalian diving reflex. And basically, we're, we're not sure how much that really works in humans. It, it used to be thought it had a bigger role than it actually does. Um, but what happens in mammals who, who dive, like seals and whales who breathe air and, and dive underwater, they slow their heart rate down, they slow their metabolism down, and they can last for long periods of time without breathing. That may happen to people to a small extent, but the other thing that probably happens is in cold water, the brain is cooled. And that allows a brain to survive longer without oxygen. In fact, with the 2010 guidelines of the American Heart Association, when someone has a cardiac arrest, we try to cool the brain if we can uh, in a post-resuscitation period if, if we get a, what we call a return of spontaneous circulation if the resuscitation has been successful. This is one way to increase survival. Yeah, I think, I think there's a whole number of things people can do to prevent drownings. The, the, the first and, and foremost is if you have children near water, and, and that means a bathtub, that means a backyard pool, that means a pool, standard size pool, that means the ocean. You have to be vigilant all the time. Drowning occurs very quickly in small children. Um, the, the things, the, sort of the presentation that you see on TV is not very accurate. In point of fact, people don't wave their arms and scream for a long time before they drown. 
that's described as distress. That's a distressed swimmer. But when people actually drown, they become silent. They can't talk, they're not able to breathe, and they sort of make ineffective movements, but most of the time their arms and legs are underwater, so you don't see it. And the only thing you may see is they roll their head backwards and then sink. So it happens very quickly. You have to be observing children to see this. And the most important thing is there's a responsible adult monitoring children anytime they're near any kind of water. Um, we've had instances where somebody's gone to answer the telephone while a child's in a bathtub with disastrous consequences. So, you know, you, you just can't take your eyes off of children around water. Now, this also brings up the point about alcohol. Uh, interestingly enough, in adolescents and adults, the use of alcohol is involved in something like 70% of drownings. It's also very important that the adult who's supervising children isn't, isn't using alcohol or other substances because that might make them less alert to the fact a child's drowning. Other things that can be done, uh, fencing around pools prevents drowning in pools um, by 85%. And float toys are not life jackets. They, you know, they, they will not prevent a child from drowning. That brings up the point of life jackets. You know, children around water, you know, people who live on the, on the water or, you know, maybe vacationing, children should have life jackets if they're in a boat or if they're on the water. Um, most of the time when people drown in boating accidents, they don't have a life jacket on. And it's, it's postulated that 50% of drownings could be prevented just by having people have life jackets on. Every year in Bermuda, during hurricane season, we have hurricane surf on the south shore. We have a drowning or a near drowning related to people going in water they shouldn't be going into. So this is, this is not an uncommon problem. The, the, the one other thing I, I forgot to mention is people who have seizure disorders, they should never swim alone. In fact, everyone should swim with a buddy. That, that's a good way to prevent drowning. But seizure patients in particular may lose consciousness from a seizure and then drown. And I actually had a cousin that, that died that way. Um, he was swimming without anyone around and, and hadn't had a seizure for a long time, had a seizure and drowned. Seizure patients should preferentially take showers and not baths because if they're taking a bath unattended, they might seize and literally drown in the bathtub. And that includes adults, so it's just something for people to think about. Knowing how to do CPR is very important because if you get to a drowning victim in time and you know effective CPR and that person is successfully resuscitated, in general they have a good outcome. If they can be resuscitated at the scene, they have a good outcome. If it's a prolonged resuscitation, they're more apt to have a poor outcome because of brain damage and uh, prolonged uh, what we call a hypoxic insult to the brain where the brain just doesn't get enough oxygen. Um, you know that. There's an old adage that you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't eat and then go into water within the first 30 minutes or so. And the idea there is when you eat, you actually shunt your blood supply to the GI tract in the liver and that helps in digestion. And you may not have as good a blood supply to your muscles and extremities, so you may become fatigued and get muscle cramps and not perform as well in the water. It's been shown that swimming lessons in children one to four is a very effective way to avoid drowning. So, you know, you, you know, a lot of people think, oh, one-year-old, two-year-old, they're too young to learn, but they're not. Worldwide, one way to reduce the incidence of drowning is to train children age one to four to be able to swim, or at least tread water, keep their head above water. Uh, so that's another very important way to keep, keep children from drowning. First and foremost, it is crucial to be vigilant around children whenever they're in or near the water. And that includes swimming pools, it includes the beach, it includes um, your bathtub at home. Um, children can drown in very shallow water. They don't have to be out in deep water over their head to drown. I think that's an important point. The next important thing is it is important to know CPR. Uh, if you know CPR and your child has a near-drowning event and you can perform effective CPR, there's an excellent chance that the child will make a full recovery, particularly if the child's removed from the water in a, in a timely fashion. And the third thing is it's very important to teach children how to swim. A lot of us would think that, you know, a child between the ages of one and four is really too young to benefit, but it's been shown that this 
dramatically reduces drowning even in children this young. So it's important to start swimming lessons at a very early age, particularly in a place like Bermuda where we're surrounded by water.